Thank you very much. And uh, I promise to get you out of here or at least outside and uh, enjoying a few ales from Mr. and Mrs. Meyer. Um, and thank you to them and thank you to uh, Rob and Lorraine for inviting me here. I was fortunate to bump into uh, Wells and Sarah up at, the, uh, at Arca Ruler in the top end of South Australia a few weeks ago and they were concerned about getting this completed and said it is a big shed, Don, and I, to, it's that big that we're actually going to call it the big shed and it is. I can uh, attest to that. Um, one, one other comment about the, the, the speakers we've had. Sed Wise uh, did a lot of work for uh, AA Company when I was managing director there for what nearly 10 years. And um, as you can understand by his, his own commentary, uh, the IT department in AA Co had certain filters in the system to make sure that there was, wasn't inappropriate um, emails coming through the system and we could never get an email from Sed Wise. So, um, it was great to see him here. He's one of the uh, very knowledgeable people in our industry. Um, look, I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the Redmond Advisory Council and, and I can start that by, in fact, uh, um, blaming John Anderson because it was, in fact, uh, during John's time as the Minister that um, the Redmond Advisory Council uh, was started. It sort of came out of the development of Meat and Livestock Australia um, when the AMLC changed and we ended up uh, with the Meat Research Corporation, the AMLC, and we had the MLA. And, uh, and as a result of that, um, Red Meat Advisory Council began, and I'll talk a little bit about what it is and why it is, um, so that you do understand, because uh, the Australian Senate, uh, in their wisdom, had no idea what it meant, and they suggested we ought to get rid of it. So, not that uh, I'm here to champion why it should or shouldn't stay, it's up to industry whether it wants to keep it, but um, it's doing some interesting things and some valuable things. So I will talk a little bit about... So I will talk about um, RMAC, I'll talk about uh, you know, how we work in the markets and, and what we're here for. I will touch on the sustainability framework very briefly, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our industry, um, some of the issues and opportunities that I see. Um, because there are many. It's been mentioned, um, John mentioned it, and others have mentioned, but everyone in this room is, is part of the largest manufacturing business in this country. In fact, the person who was, I think perhaps sat opposite you, Simon Crean, during your time, and Simon is a director of the, of the Redman Advisory Council and a, and a very strong adv advocate for industry these days and, very, and, a, and a great director. And, and when that dawned on him, he really has championed the cause, as has everybody. You know, this is the biggest, biggest game in town, and, and we need to understand that, and I'll touch on that in regard to LPA and why things like LPA are vital for a $23 billion industry. So who, who are we? So really, Armac, as I said, was formed some, few, some years ago, and what we do is a number of things. One is there was some 40 odd million dollars of industry reserve funds that existed at the, at the end of AMLC, MRC era. And we are charged with the responsibility of managing those, that money and utilising the, um, the output or the returns from that for the betterment of industry. So that's one of the key things. And we do this under a memorandum of understanding with government. The other thing we do is that we advise the government of the day. So I have a direct responsibility as chairman to advise the minister of the day, and the current minister is in fact, again, the deputy prime minister in, uh, in Barnaby Joyce, and we also have a, a strong relationship uh, with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Stephen Chobo, who's doing a terrific job, I'd have to say. Um, so we're working and making sure that they do understand exactly what our industry wants, um, the issues, and our, our view on that. The next part of that is that this is the one forum where what Jason Strong talked about actually exists at the top level. So you have all the parts of the chain in the one room at the one time. And that's pretty rare. So we've got all the processing, all, we have retail as well in a sense um, via the Australian Meat Industry Council, um, live exporters, sheep, goats, the whole lot. So this is a great opportunity for our industry to, to in fact um, to sit down, talk about what we can do together to make this whole thing work. Um, so when, when there is opportunity for the whole of industry to take a position on something and you go and bang on the door of government, they will listen to you. One of the problems we've had is that there has been a disparate 
sort of message float, floating through. And this is particularly so in the cattle industry. And uh, one of the tasks that I'm working feverishly on at the moment is to try and get, in fact, a united voice in the cattle industry. There's a lot of work being done on it. And Troy Setter is chairing a, a group that I think we are getting quite close to uh, finalising that. And we may, in fact, have a, an organisation that can really deliver. And um, so when you knock on the door, here you are. This is the cattle industry in Australia. So as I said, we manage the fund, we advise the minister, um, and, and we also, more particularly, we have a direct responsibility for the development of the meat industry strategic plan. And one of the things that um, is part of that plan um, this year, which, which um, is different from previous years, is that this one really does have some key performance indicators on whether we've failed or, su or succeeded. One of the problems we've got, and there's a, a mid-term review underway at the moment, one of the problems we've got is the actions are fine. We are doing all the actions to bring the plan into effect. But what we haven't got is an ability to understand whether that's actually delivered on the ground. And Howard Smith from the Cattle Council and I had this discussion one evening, and he said, we decided and understood years and years and years ago that controlled mating and things like that were important, and yet in large areas of Australia they still haven't done that. This whole adoption and extension thing is, is such a, a problem. Uh, I'm chairman of a, of a large organisation involved in uh, cotton and, and grain, um, and the day something is invented, they've got it in place the following morning. I ran a, one of Australia's largest feedlots. The day that something is invented, you put it in. If you're in intensive agriculture, you do it straight away. Broad scale, because you've got a mix of people who, who it isn't their principal form of income, they just, it just isn't happening fast enough, and we have to deal with that. So we want to make sure that this plan, and we understand what we want to do, we are doing the actions to achieve it, we've got to make sure that we actually see the delivery on the ground. And I'd have to say at the moment that's probably not happening as well as we'd like. Some of the, um, some of the things that we are particularly involved with uh, is our, our role in, in terms of government. The key part of that activity is really around trade and market access. So if you look at what has been done um, in Japan, Korea, South Korea and in China, where the Redmond Advisory Council um, established um, what we call task forces um, for each of those, and they were chaired by uh, leading industry people and the people involved from all sectors, and we advised government and advised directly into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and had a direct relationship with uh, Francis Lisson, who was the head negotiator in, in those uh, particular free trade agreements. And we delivered a consistent message. And I think we got a great result from that. The chair of the, of the task force for EU and UK was here. He may well have taken off, and that's Jason Strong. Um, and Jason and I are working very closely to make sure we deliver on the opportunities that are becoming available in Europe and the United Kingdom. When you've got two children, it's pretty hard to say oh, one's a favourite. And EU UK is just that. Uh, who do you talk to first? How do you deal with that, that issue of two people who were in one family, now they've split? Um, don't talk to them, talk to me. You've got all the issues around that and we're working uh, very well, I believe. Um, I had a, had a long uh, meeting yesterday with our um, agricultural attaché in Brussels and, uh, and she is a very strong advocate for our industry and we're working closely with her and with Alexander Downer and others to try and make sure that we deliver on, on the opportunities that exist in the, United, in the United Kingdom, which we've had very little exposure to in recent years since they entered the EU, and of course um, with the EU itself where there's 500 million people. Um, so we are producing product that really can make a big difference. I'm conscious of how long this is going to take me, so I'm going to motor along. Um, just one other thing on, um, on trade. One of the, the forgotten things is, is non-tariff trade barriers. Um, the work was done by MLA recently, which uh, actually indicates there's about $3.5 billion in trade barriers of a non-tariff nature. So there's a lot of work to be done there, and the government has uh, actually put a minister in charge of that in Keith Pitt, and um, there's a lot of things being done to try and capture what is some low-hanging fruit, if we can actually grab it, 
these are big negotiations in a sense with government. There's some of the things that, are, that can be done simply if we can actually get some common sense into some of these, which is often very difficult. So, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, with regard to the sustainability, um, when we set this up and Prue um, took on the role, there was always a lot of negativity about, you know, what are you doing to us? What, what are you controlling us? And I hated the original term of social licence. I, I thought, you know, I was, like, I was like the old brigade. What are you doing telling me how to run my business and et cetera? The reality of life is they can tell you how to run your business. Uh, we have to accept that. We've got to understand that we need to keep in, in front of the game here. Uh, and I'll touch on a, a little bit of that in a moment. Um, Rob, Rob Cinnamon um, has uh, hopefully agreed to be part of a consultative group which will in fact stress test all the work that's being done by, um, by the committee. And the new chair of that committee is Bryce Cam from, um, from Queensland. And we've got a good spread of people and, and uh, I think the first consultative committee meeting is coming up. So um, we're engaging with people and we're going to make sure that, uh, that we do in fact deliver on the opportunities for industry and we, and we keep ahead. Um, I'd just like to touch on my old company, um, Rangers Valley, in a, just to utilise it to talk a bit about a couple of things. Um, if you want to build a brand, and, and when I, I first, I was managing director at AA Company for 10 years, and we built and developed the brands in the company, and it's the most engaging, the most rewarding, and the most frightening thing you can do. Because you put your name on something and you lob it in front of someone. And uh, you're on, on, you know, on notice every morning. Ian Mars can attest to that, having run the biggest beef cattle in, in business in this country. It is a, it is, is a great thing to do, though. It focuses your mind on what that person wants. It focuses your mind on where the value is. And the reality of life is that we all sit here, as I did for years, thinking that if you had a big backside on an animal, that's where the money was. Let me tell you, it's not. It's in a whole lot of other places, and if you move into the Wagyu industry, that's when you start to understand that. The day that I bought the West Home Wagyu herd and inspected it for AA Company, I saw $10 million worth of the worst looking cattle I've ever seen. I spent 50 years trying to breed cattle that don't look like that. But the reality of life is the value is not in a, in the, it's in a different place. So. If you take a product like Rangers, selling the four quarter cuts is a piece of cake. Um, selling the butt cuts is very difficult. So you've got to understand really where the value is. But you've got to underpin it with all these things that are up there. And that's what sustainability frameworks are about. Um, indulge me, those two photographs, uh, one is the Fairmont Hotel in Monaco, and the other one is the Monte Carlo Club in Abu Dhabi. And we took when I took Rangers Valley to Europe, we conducted a, a forum at 150 people there one Saturday morning and we did a presentation and a man from Germany came up to me and said, Don, I think your meat is fantastic, but he said, you've got to tick some boxes before I'll even talk to you. I want to see your safety policy for staff. I want to see your environmental policy. I want to understand your animal welfare and I want to know that someone's audited them. If you do that, I'll buy your meat. If you don't tick those boxes, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not even going to talk to you. And that was the day that really hammered home to me that the things that are frightening us, things like LPA, um, I know there's noise around why you're being charged $60, why do we have to fill in the form, all those things. This is a $23 billion food industry. And if we don't come to grips with that and accept that people are going to judge us, and we've got to get ahead of that, then I think um, then we'll have a successful industry, which we already have, but we've got to be, we're going to be challenged every day. My phone's sitting over there. Those little phones change the world. Um, every minute of every day, somebody's taking a picture and sending it everywhere. So you've just got to deal with that. And this particular one is a hobby horse of mine. Um, I'm happy to work with WWF, terrific. Happy to work with RSPCA, fantastic. But it's very difficult to work with someone who is an animal rights person. Welfare is our business. We've been involved in it forever and we want to continue to be there. Rights are different. And I think we need to get our language around that and, and call it for what it is. Because if somebody doesn't want you to have a pet dog at home or ride a horse, the fact that you're going to kill them humanely is not going to help. 
and the reality is these people are getting traction. It is causing great difficulty for the RSPCA around funding um, because a lot of money is flowing in other directions. So we need to make sure we support these organisations because we are doing the right thing. And we've got to make sure we've got the systems to indicate that we are, and then I think we're, our industry will flow. Quickly, Rangers Valley's customers have changed dramatically. This is just purely as an example. When I first joined the organisation, 80% of it went to Japan. The day I left, it was 20. It's going to 20 countries all over the world. Cuts go everywhere. Nobody sells full sets of any volume these days. It's all changed. And we have to be, embrace that and be a part of that. So this is just a particular example of where, of where things have changed. Um, and, and we need to embrace it and embrace it in our cattle and embrace it in the way we engage with our supply chain. LiveX, LiveX is clearly an important part of, of, this in, of our industry. Um, I put that there as much because I liked the photo. Um, I was actually on Campfield Station, one of the AOK places. And it will remain an important part of our business. And you saw Mrs. Reinhardt talk about what they're doing, um, the importance of the industry in Indonesia and others. So we need to do it right. And, and the question um, around what we did wrong, um, we've now got to make sure we do it right. SCAS and the, the next extension of that uh, will ensure that we can in fact do that. Um, I'll skip some of these. These are some of the brands that we developed. And um, I, had an, I, had a, I had one on the AAK one, but with Jason here, I decided I shouldn't do that. I think he's gone. I'm safe. So just, just to sort of wind it up, um, for us, for this industry to flourish and be what it, what it can be, and, and be the sort of things that, that people like Mrs. Reinhardt see. Um, I'm working for the Forest family in Western Australia. These are people with no inhibitions about things. They look at things differently. They see the opportunity and not you know, the, the problems of history. So for us to capture some of those things, we have to do, the, do what's required. So we've got to stay ahead of the public. We've got to stay ahead of government. We've got to make sure we are doing those things now so that uh, that isn't, a, that isn't an issue for us. We're not reacting, which was the exact the problem around Indonesia in 2011. If we stay ahead, then we will just keep on going and we'll maintain the support of the public. There's no question we have the support of the majority of the public, but it's, it's chipping away at the edges. We've got to make sure that we maintain that edge. Work tirelessly to, to improve the understanding and respect across the whole chain. Understand who your customer is, how to deal with them, their problems. We've seen, as I think uh, Richard Norton said, the most profitable meat processing, the most profitable production, and they've swapped over. We do have to deal with this somehow or other. The first time in my life, and I stood in um, the Deputy PM's office about two years ago, and I said to Barnaby, um, you'll see $3 a kilo for cattle. And... Um, and he wasn't sure that I was right. We actually saw four. Um, this is the first time in my life the things that I'm responsible for, beef cattle, sheep and lambs and goat, are all at, at or near record prices. So it may not necessarily stay there for a bit, but I think we've reached a new level. We've got to make sure we maintain that. So don't get caught up in the euphoria of things. Focus on what you've got to do. We are definitely not a commodity high volume supplier. We are a high value. Unfortunately, uh, high cost. But if you supply somebody in a China, as Rangers Valley does, say uh, Morton Steakhouses or um, the Sheraton Group or any of those groups, they won't buy local product because they've got a brand that is reliant on maintaining its performance around the world. We saw McDonald's have a problem in, in China about 18 months or two years ago. Um, the risks associated are huge. We can do things that other countries can't. We won't compete with bakso balls made from Indian buffalo in Indonesia, but they can't put a high quality steak in a five star restaurant and we can. So make sure we do understand what we do well and, and focus on that. Keep improving and I think you'll find that this industry will go from strength to strength as it should. Thank you very much to the Meyer family for having me here. And, um, I'm delighted to have been involved and to uh, Rob and Lorraine, thank you. And uh, it's been a great day. You've only got Rob to uh, give his words of wisdom at the end. Um, so thank you all very much.
Uh, thanks very much there, Don. Is there one question or...? All right, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it was uh, great hearing you, Don, and um, coming all the way, and um, it was very good insight into what's going on outside the, the industry overseas as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're starting to come down to the um, last speaker. Uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, yes, Rob. Rob will um, just make a presentation to Don, sorry. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Don, on behalf of Yugo Bar, uh, we'd just like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Uh, those words of wisdom that we've spoken this afternoon, I think, are enlightening. And, and I actually wrote down your comment there, uh, uh, identify the opportunities rather than the roadblocks. And I think there's a real message for all of us, and that uh, truly a take-home message for me. And I do enjoy uh, being involved with that uh, committee in the future. Terrific. I might Thanks. be, a, I might be a, a apology for the first one because it's prior our bull sale. That's all right. <laughs>